Hey, welcome back to Laura Coach Show here on Sirius XM POTUS. We are just merely hours away now from the much anticipated debate of negotiations and debt ceiling negotiations between President Biden and the leadership from both houses, both chambers. More on all this in a moment. Here, here is David Bonson, founder and managing partner of the Bonson Group, a $4 billion wealth management firm. He's also the author of There's No Free Lunch, 250 Economic Truths, and author of DividendCafe.com and a podcast series through National Review called No Free Lunch. He tweets at David Bonson, B-A-H-N-S-E-N, and he joins us now. Welcome back. How are you, David? Good morning. Well, good to be back with you. Glad you're here today. Listen, obviously, all eyes are on the White House and this negotiation about the debt ceiling. But there continue to be conversations surrounding the bank failures. And it seems just last week, if it's any indication between PacWest and others, that the banking industry is not out of the water yet, out of the woods yet. Tell me what the latest are. Well, I think that there is ongoing uh, concerns that if depositors do keep pulling money out, and the, and the deposit withdrawals have definitely slowed down, but there is an increasing realization that even those banks that have assets uh, that are greater than their liabilities, they have good assets and they can borrow from the Fed to provide liquidity against those assets. The problem is that they're going to borrow from the Fed at 5%, and a lot of the loans that they've extended out are at 3%. And so they essentially have a funding mechanism right now that locks in a loss. And that's certainly what did in First Republic, but there's other banks that are in a similar position. And so the deposits have to stay strong to keep their funding at a low cost so that they can actually stay in business. In terms of the, the public perception of the security of our banking institutions, you know, we hear the news, we see a lot about it, and it's, it's frankly, you know, unsettling to think about um, a revisiting of the 2008 crisis. Are we close to that, or is this a matter of regulation working or needing to be beefed up? Um, we're not even in the same stratosphere as 2008, and, and that isn't because I think regulation's working. It, it's just that we're simply dealing with a totally different category, and I think it's really important that it kind of be covered a bit more accurately because the sensational part about 08 uh, w- lingers for a lot of people, and that's where a whole bunch of people did not pay back money that they owed, and that includes the banks that were, you know, planning on receiving payments on these mortgages. They owed other banks money, and there were bondholders and all sorts of uh, integrated financial actors that were blowing up together. We have had three banks go down in the last two months and not a single payment has been missed. I mean, I'm sure there's a a couple default borrowers here and there, but it has nothing to do with what's gone on. Uh, It's the first financial saga that I've studied in history that isn't related to credit impairment, isn't related to a deterioration of people actually paying back money they owe, not the financial crisis of 08, not the savings and loan crisis, not the whole blow up in Japan. Uh, this is a very weird deal because everybody was paying their bills. It's just that interest rates going higher mismatched assets and liabilities and threw some banks in disarray. It is not going to become a systemic risk. Well, speaking of the ability to pay one's bills, the debt ceiling showdown is continuing. Warren Buffett just on Saturday was criticizing the handling of the recent tumult in the banking sector and called the showdown um, a potential to bring turmoil to the financial system. Um, What do you make of this debt ceiling showdown and what impact it could have? Well, I've kind of been on two sides of this because on one hand, my view is that if the Republicans did not vote to increase the debt ceiling on their own, along with their own budget and and set of things that they want to see, then they had no right to hold the debt ceiling hostage. But that if they did actually pass a measure, which I thought was going to be very hard for them to do, but obviously Speaker McCarthy ended up being able to do it, holding moderates and some of the farther right people in his caucus together, then it really forces the White House to negotiate. They can't say with a straight face 
that anyone who will let the debt ceiling uh, not be extended is holding the country hostage when now at this point the Republicans have done it and they haven't. So they do need to negotiate, and the Republicans aren't going to get all they want. And I would imagine that some spending cuts will come and some energy permitting reforms will come. Uh, but that's sort of what the messy process is supposed to be like. And obviously, in a highly polarized political environment, it gets a little ugly. But yeah, at this point, I think there has to be substantive conversations between the White House and Speaker McCarthy. What do you think ought to be? The, the the concessions i mean you know you've got the in years past there's been what the white house is calling a a clean debt ceiling um raise and republicans now including senator mitch mcconnell talking about some of the conditions that need to be met to ensure that we're not in this perpetual cycle of you know every year dealing with this very issue what do you think based on your expertise you think would be reasonable negotiation terms Yeah, I think there's a difference between what I think would be reasonable and what is politically feasible. Sure. Because I think it would be reasonable to get rid of the debt ceiling, but to actually start balancing a budget every year. And there's no possible way that's going to happen. So I do think the debt ceiling idea itself is absurd. Approving raising the debt to cover spending that they've already approved to do. Um, I, I think, it, how, on the other hand, they're not going to get rid of it, and there certainly is no interest in actually balancing a budget, so we are sort of stuck in this cycle. For this purpose, though, I think a 1% uh, limit on spending increase was a pretty reasonable request, and, and I was surprised that some of the hardline folks in Speaker McCarthy's caucus went along with it, but I don't think it's unreasonable, and I'm sure there are some knobs that will turn back the other way, but essentially... Uh, there is a big need to control spending. And I feel qualified to say that because I was saying it when Trump was in the White House, too, where a lot of Republicans seem to only get worried about spending when the other party is in the White House. But no, I think that this, President Biden has spent recklessly, and I think President Trump spent recklessly. And there is a need to get spending under control, but the debt ceiling is a difficult way to do it. Right now, I would just go along with the 1% increase. I'll tell you what, I, I mean, spoiler alert, the next president will also engage in spending that's called reckless. <laughs> and, the, and probably the next one after that, depending upon who you ask on these issues. But you, you mentioned something in particular that I, I find intriguing. That I, I hear this a lot, and that's the idea of there's no interest in balancing a budget. Um, you know, some say it's a pipe dream. Others say it's really not necessary. Where do you come down? Well, of course it's necessary. I think that the um, fact that our country is so economically productive and over 30 years has outperformed expectations for output has enabled us to get away with spending above our means. But I would like to point out that the cost of that has now been 1.6% economic growth per year for 15 years, half of our average in economic growth. We're running at half of what we have done since World War II. And the reason for that is that so much more of our economic output is going to uh, the public sector and serving the excessive indebtedness. So I'm a big believer that we can allocate capital more effectively, employ more people, pay higher wages, get better uh, innovation in the economy. Um, We use the term at my firm, Japanification, to describe what happens when you don't balance a budget and get spending in line. Uh, Of course, there's going to be debate as to what we have to cut. And and that's fine. I think that there's a legitimate room for debate as to what size of government we want to have. But no, I don't believe it is appropriate or sustainable to perpetually think that our bond market will fund one to two trillion dollars of excess spending. And in fact, our bond market really isn't doing it. The Federal Reserve has simply helped monetize that for quite a long time now. We will see just in a few hours from now how these negotiations unfold. Thank you for joining us today. Have a great rest of your day, David. Thanks so much, Laura. You can follow him on Twitter at David Bunsen, B-A-H-N-S-E-N. He also has a podcast series through the National Review called No Free Lunch and the author of Dividend Cafe.